All right. Y'all ready for this? All right. Yeah, there you go. I love it. I was waiting for somebody to start singing the tune. It's good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, open your Bibles to John chapter 1 if you have them. Uh, if not, there'll be words on the screen here in a moment. Um, but... Uh, Man, I, we're starting a new series today called Arrival, and we're talking about with this, as we turn our attention toward Christmas and the Christmas season, just the amazing things that, uh, that come with the arrival of Jesus, some of the most beautiful things that come with the arrival of Jesus. Uh, and if you're like me, you love Christmas. Uh, I don't know if you are, but if you are, you love Christmas. It's like your favorite time. What happened to the trees? What is going on? Just don't. Don't look at that. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit. No, don't worry about fixing them. Just we'll we'll let we'll let them dance. The joy of their Lord is their strength. That's uh. We're gonna make we're gonna make some sort of churchy thing out of that. Uh, don't. So anyway, um. But uh, I love Christmas because of things like that. Um and. It's like my favorite time of the year. Like from Thanksgiving to Super Bowl Sunday, I'm in heaven. You know, it's like it's the greatest, the greatest place for me. I love the music. I love the trees. I love the movies and the stories. I love fat family gatherings and getting together with family. I love long breaks with our kids. It's really just I love this time of the year. It's just there's no better time. Um, and uh, but one thing that I love most, if you can't tell is Christmas lights. I love Christmas lights so much, and uh, it, there's nothing in my mind than like the, the clean lines of lights on a house in a neighborhood as you drive by at Christmas to get me in the mood for Christmas. Here, watch this. All right. Um, <laughs> watch this. Here we go. I saw somebody's eyes go there, and I was like, all right, you're just going to turn it off. Like, we're just going to, it's okay. Um, and I just talked about how much I love lights, and I just turned them off. Um, yeah. It's a God thing. He was doing it to me. Uh, anyway, but I, I love, I love just the clean lines of lights that just trim uh, a house. We got some uh, lights put on the church uh, this year, which I think just looks amazing. If you come by here at night, it's really beautiful. But the houses across the street, they're like out of like Southern Living magazine. Have you guys noticed this? They are like just, they put me in the mood for Christmas. And I absolutely love it. It's so classic and so timeless. And I, and I love, uh, it's like the lights are what really get me in the mood for all the other stuff, for all the, the fun and, and uh, everything that comes with the season. But um, I also love the fact that Christmas lights represent something to those of us who are followers of Jesus and, and those of us who are Christians, and that is the hope that we have at Jesus' arrival. And so we're going to talk about that this morning uh, as we look at the, at, at the first chapter of John. So John chapter 1, starting verse 1, we're going to read through verse 5. It says this, In the beginning was the Word... And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I love the way John's gospel starts. It starts so beautifully. It's this beautiful poem about the word. And, uh, and yet, if you are new to reading the Bible, you probably realize really easily one of the things that trips people up when it comes to reading scripture is that doesn't sound like anyone who talks in everyday life right now, right? Like you start reading that and you're like, oh, that doesn't sound like normal speak to me. Uh, and, uh, and so, but, but we, we can get thrown off by this kind of beginning of how he's back and forth between the word and um, all of that kind of stuff. But, but we should not lose heart too quickly because there's a lot of beauty and nuance in these, these, just these few verses. And so let's start with in the beginning. 
All right. In the beginning, uh, Mark's gospel starts a lot the same way. It points us to creation, points us to the first page of the Bible, points us to uh, Genesis chapter one. And and Mark's gospel starts similarly. And the reason why John is probably starting similar to Mark is because John was written last. Um, So John was the last gospel written. It's likely that he probably would have seen the words of Mark and been like, oh, that is where we need to start. We need to start in that same spot. Let's start at the beginning. And, uh, And so he draws our attention onto creation and onto the God of creation. And, he, and, he's, and he's leading us forward in John chapter one in this poem to a climax of the poem where it gets to a place where it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now this word dwelt in the Greek is the word tabernacled with. All right, so it means uh, to set up a tent with. Um, it's, it, and if you know anything about the significance of the tabernacle, you quickly begin to understand what John is getting at here and what he's doing. The tabernacle, uh, which would become the temple at a later date in the Old Testament, in view of the biblical writers and the Israelites, was the intersection of God's world and our world. It was the uniting of heaven and earth. It is the place in which people would go to meet with God. This is, this is what we see in Isaiah chapter 6 when he stumbles into the throne room of, of heaven. And, and Isaiah has this vision of just the legs and the, and the, and the train of God's robe. And it's, it's, it's the bottom, right? It's the bottom of heaven meeting earth is essentially what the picture is supposed to be giving. It's this image that we get even in Genesis with Jacob and he sees this ladder coming down from heaven. So it's a gate. It's an intersection of these two two worlds of heaven and earth. And from the very outset, John is making a claim that this intersection of heaven and earth is no longer a place. It's no longer a building, but it's a person. And that person is the word, and that word is God, and that God is Jesus. And everything that is or will be finds its beginning in him. Can we just say that's an amazing couple of lines of the Bible, right? Like all of that just right there. But there's also this really powerful thing that begins to unpack in these few verses as you go even further, um, and that is that he was the life, and that life was light, and that light cannot be overcome by the darkness. Now, let's stick with this idea of light for just a second. Have you ever noticed in Genesis chapter 1 that the light comes three days before the sun, moon, and stars? You ever notice this? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning on the first day. Now skip down to verse 14 of Genesis 1, where day 4 begins, and it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. Expanse of the heavens is the Hebrew word rakia. It means the sky, or the dome above the earth, essentially, is the idea that, that the biblical writers are getting at. So it says, uh, so let there be lights in the uh, rakia to separate the day from the night and let them be the signs for the seasons and for the days and the years and let them be lights in the rakia to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the rakia to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning on the fourth day. So there was light three days, three days before there was ever sun, moon, or stars. Now, when you begin to study Genesis chapter 1, you begin to to realize it's also a poem, and it has a very particular literary design. Day 1 and day 4 go together, and day 2 and day 5 go together, and day 3 and day 6 go together. 
And so they have this very kind of like neat stacking. If you were to like break it down or draw it out or something like that, it kind of looks like a little neat graph. Um, But you also begin to realize that days one through three, what God does is he creates. And days four through six, he, he delegates his authority of creation to other things, to other created beings. So on day four, he delegates the, the, the ruling or the, the ruling of time, essentially, uh, of day and night to the sun, moon, and stars. And, uh, and it all builds to this very climactic point in day six where he creates human beings and, and then he charges human beings to rule and have dominion over the earth. This is what we are meant to be in our image uh, bearing self of Christ. Christ or, or God creates us to be in his image and rule with him. That's what he desires. And so when we hear um, that um, Jesus, going back to John, you hear that Jesus uh, becomes Adam. Adam is the Hebrew word for human. Uh, it's where, why we call Adam, Adam. It's because that's the Hebrew word for human being. And, uh, and Eve just means life. So Adam and Eve are human life. Um, but they, they are delegated to rule over all created things. And, and he, is also, um, he is also the light. So Jesus comes and he's, he's the human that we were all intended to be that rules and reigns with God over the created order of the land and over the world. And yet he also is the light that showed up before anything else showed up. And displays that he has ruling over the entire universe. So what John is proclaiming is not just that that, that Jesus is a man, but he is also God. You see, like this is all tied together. That he is in control of not just the world and showing us what it looks like to be human and rule as human beings are called to rule with God. but, But he is also in control of the whole cosmos. It's this really, really beautiful thing that John is doing. But then when you take that one step further and you see that, um, and, and you think about um, the space of Genesis 1 uh, before there is light, it's just darkness. Do you realize that darkness is the only thing that God didn't create? It was what was present before God spoke anything into creation. It was the the the, the, the voidness of God and of life in general. And so when he speaks, when his word comes out of his mouth, life is born and light is born. It's a really, really interesting thing. But what happens when, when that light shows up, when that light shows up on day one, is the darkness can no longer overcome it. That's what John is saying. When that light shows up, the darkness can no longer overcome it. In the Greek, uh, the word has not is this present future tense. Uh, It's using a present future tense, meaning that it is like now and tomorrow and forever. It will never change. It's unchanging. Another way of saying it is that the darkness has not, cannot, and will not (laughs) overcome this light. Now, What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? When we talk about Jesus being the light, what does it mean? Well, it means Jesus is the arrival of hope that has not and cannot and will not ever be overcome by any amount of darkness in our life. That's why it's my favorite thing about Christmas is the lights. It's because they remind me that there is nothing in my life that God cannot overcome. That Jesus has not proven he can overcome. And I know, man, that there are some really dark things, right? Probably if we were to take a poll in here, it's, it's very different as to what the struggles are or what the darkness feels like or where the darkness stems from. But we all have experienced these dark days, haven't we? The thought of losing a child is dark in my mind. 
I can't imagine the kind of darkness that there is in burying your, your baby. But some of you in this room have done that. You've experienced that. I can't imagine going and showing up to an ultrasound to hear that there's no more heartbeat. And some of you have experienced that. It's dark. It's painful. It's hurtful. Some of you have lost a child because they, they were raised in your house and then they've just decided to go their separate way. And you haven't seen them in a while. You miss them. And the holidays really are hard because you don't get to see them as much. Maybe you're grieving someone who has just recently passed or has passed since last Christmas. Or just who, when you show up and you talk about all the memories or you think about all the great Christmases of the past, they don't remember them because they're not really here anymore. Maybe uh, you just feel the tension of political strife in our nation. Does anybody else feel that like I do as a pastor of a church who, who watches Christians every four years just get at each other's throats because they decided to put their hope in something that wasn't Jesus? That's tough. Maybe it's war because that's going on right now, right? And we think about, man, why is there so much evil in the world why, does the, why, why, do, why do these things happen? Well, the loss of innocent life and natural disaster where communities and people's lives are absolutely wrecked and destroyed. Or maybe you've lost a job or you're looking for a job that you feel like is never going to come. Now you're all kind of like, oh man, this started really nice and joyful and we were laughing and, <laughs> and now I'm depressed, right? So God, I, I'm just saying, like we, we all know that darkness, don't we? We know the darkness of our sin, of things that we struggle with that we wish we didn't, but it just seems to always rear its ugly head again and again. All these things can make and cause life to feel hopeless and cause us to lose hope because these things feel insurmountable in the moment. They feel so difficult and like such a struggle. But here's what I think. I think if the words that John writes here in John 1 are true, and I believe they are, you're going to have to determine for yourself if you believe if they are. But I believe with all of my heart that these words are true. If they are true, then we have an ability to maintain and have hope no matter how dark our days get because God is still ruling and reigning over it all and he cannot and will not be overcome. And that light, just a little flicker of light in the midst of the darkness can give us hope. And I hope that Jesus can be that for you this Christmas. That he can bring you back into the light. Church, my hope is, is that this Christmas you'd have this immense and strong hope and strong joy. Because with Jesus' arrival, I mean Christmas is supposed to be a celebration of that hope. A celebration of that light that cannot be overcome. But I know for some of you that will feel unauthentic. It'll feel like, ah, I just, I'm not, I can't. I just, n darkness is too great. Well, can I propose a reason why that might be? If you're having a hard time finding hope in Jesus this Christmas, I think it might be because, because you've, lost focus on Jesus. See, if darkness is not and cannot be overcome and yet it feels like it is, like just insurmountable, it's likely because our eyes have moved off 
of Christ. And we've lost focus on what's really important. It's easy to do, especially in America during Christmas time. It's easy to lose focus on what this is really all about. I'm reminded of the writer of Hebrews and what he says in Hebrews chapter 12. He encourages the the folks that he's writing to and us. He says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. He reminds us to fix our eyes on Jesus. This, This idea is an Olympic idea. It's, a, it's like what athletes would do in the Olympics. So like back in the first century when people would run in the Olympics, they didn't like, like have spray paint or anything to make out lines. They, there were like lanes for the guys to run in. So what they would do is they'd take like a piece of wood and they'd stake it down at the end of the track. And that was how runners stayed in their lane. They, they looked up and they fixed their eyes on that stake and they took off running the race that they had marked out for them. And it kept them from veering to the left or the right, from looking to the left or the right. Their eyes stayed fixed on that stake. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus should be for us as Christians as we go through life. And he's talking to Christians who are being persecuted, who are being crucified on crosses. And he's saying to them, fix your eyes on Jesus because he's the hope. Run the race marked out for you. You keep your eyes on him, you won't veer to the left or to the right. And so if the darkness seems too much, it's likely because we've, we've looked at a different mark other than Jesus. We're aiming at the wrong target. And we've lost hope because our hope, which is before us, is out of sight. The good news of the gospel is we can always come back. We can always refocus our attention back on Christ. We can refocus our attention back on the light and run in his direction. And if we do that, we'll find hope. And we'll move out of this feeling of darkness. Because with the arrival of Jesus, it is this arrival of hope which, which will not put us to shame, the Bible says. It's an arrival of salvation. It's an arrival of a king bent on bringing us out of darkness and into light. Look at what 1 Peter says here. 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, but you were chosen. You were wanted. God wanted you, so he chose you. And uh, your chosen race. He's, he's talking about the church. He's talking about all people, which is a very interesting thing because the people of the church uh, that, that they're speaking to is a many different races. But in, in Christ, our race is no longer defined by the color of our skin, but by the, the hope we have in Christ. That's our race. We are a chosen race, that that's our new identity. And so you have a new identity. Uh, you've been chosen you are wanted. You, you, you are a, a royal priesthood. You are sons and daughters of a king. And you are a priesthood. You're able to approach the throne of grace with confidence because Jesus broke down the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. You're a holy nation. You're set apart for God's purpose. You're set apart to discern and do his will, what he wants for you to do. For his own possession, he bought you with his blood. And the reason why is that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, your God, Jesus Christ. Who called you like he spoke light into the darkness in the very beginning. He called your name. And he said, come out of the darkness and come into marvelous light. There is nothing, there is no amount of darkness that he can't overcome. There's no amount of guilt or shame that he can't overcome. 
There's no amount of sin that he can't overcome. There's no amount of struggle or torment that he can't overcome. And he's calling your name, reminding you of who you are, saying, come out of the darkness and live in the light. Live in the light. You know, next week, we are, uh, we're going to invite people to, to follow Jesus in baptism. And uh, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus or be baptized, I, I would encourage you to, uh, to take that step. You know, to, to bury your sins in the death of Christ and be raised to new life because that's what Christ puts on offer. If that's something that you want to do that you've never done, I want to invite you to fill that out on your Connect card. Uh, write that on your Connect card. We'd love to connect with you this week and invite you into that. Um, if you want to talk to me after church or Brian after church or uh, David, anybody, we'd love to, love to help you take that next step if that's something that you need to do. It'd be a great story and a great testimony this, this Christmas to be able to say, yeah, I remember when God called me out of darkness and brought me into light. And um, there's no better time to do it than right now. So that's something that you feel called to do. We'd love to have you make that decision and uh, we'd love to help you make that decision. But maybe you're just, maybe you're just dealing with some tough stuff right now. I get that. Um, I just encourage you uh, to remember what this season is all about. To focus your attention back on Jesus. To put your focus back on Christ. Because he is the light. And whatever you're going through, if you'll focus on him, he'll, he'll shine some light in the midst of that darkness. So I just want to encourage you and remind you of that. Because we can all do that. We can always come back. We can always repent and always find ourselves focused on him again. So if you lost focus, like, just say, I'm sorry. My eyes were wandering. I was led astray. But I'm back. He'll have you back. He'll have you back. Because as Peter says... Jesus does this that we who once lived in darkness but do so no more can proclaim the goodness and proclaim his glory. That's the message. That's a real message of Christmas. And that's really the message of the gospel. Why this is such a, a season that we celebrate as Christians. Um, it's because the gospel is wrapped up in this message. And it's a beautiful gift to take hold of. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this morning and just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here and to worship you, to give you praise, to be reminded of the light that is Christ and the hope and the life that comes in him. God, I pray, I pray right now that you would call a son than a daughter out of the darkness. They would hear your voice and that they would follow you. They would give their whole life to run the race that you've marked out for them. God, I pray that those of us who have lost focus and we put our attention on other things and we've begun to wander from this or from that, God, I pray that we would just fix our eyes on you and let you begin to shine your light through your power and through your spirit into our life in a way that we have never <laughs> knew possible, never realized before. But God, I, pr I pray that if we give ourselves to, to focusing our attention on you and you alone, that you will meet us there. That you will meet us there. And that you will make Make the darkness light up like never before. 
God, we love you. We praise you. And thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.